Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Business. I'm Priyanshi Sharma and let's first start with how the markets performed today. Well, uh, it's been a great few weeks for the markets and investors. Nifty ended just a shy of 20,000 today as the index touched an intraday high of 19,991, just nine points short of 20,000 before retreating to the 19,797 level. Well, Sensex also rallied 474 points to end at 67,571. Among sectoral indices, banks led the charge with gains of over 1%. IT index was a laggard to end with a cut of 7 tenths of a percent. My colleague Hiral Dhan Nadia joins us from the BQ Prime Newsroom with a wrap of all the market action. Over to you, Hira. A day when the markets were waiting for Nifty to hit that 20,000 mark, taking the moves into consideration, but it clearly failed and we ended just almost nearly 30 points away from those 20,000 levels. Though the rally has continued for six consecutive sessions and we've ended at the day's highest levels, Nifty around at 19,950, whereas Sensex saw gains of almost around 450 points coming in there. There was clear outperformance from Bank Nifty in today's session and if you talk about the broader markets as well, they clearly underperformed and ended on a pretty flat note. In terms of sectors, IT as well as power, these were two sectors which actually ended in the negative and the major pressure came in from an Infosys ahead of the numbers as well. Uh, overall, if you see in terms of the coiners, you had an ITC, uh, a strong move coming in there and one of the top contributors as well to the gains we saw in the markets. Kotak Mahindra Bank, ICICI, DRL as well as Grasim. In fact, ICICI Bank as well as Access Bank are rallying uh, to actually finish the line at that 1,000 level. Initially, we were talking about 900 and now they're marching towards those 1,000 levels. On the losing end, Infosys was the top loser followed by names like Ultratech Cement, Aisha Motors uh, as well as uh, Bajaj Finser in trade. On the back of earnings, stocks like Zenza Technologies, Polycab, Havels India and Coforge reacted to numbers in today's session. And if you talk about newsmakers, Reliance Industries listed at 2611 after the special pre-open session for price discovery. SJVN has signed an order on the back of which we saw strong moves there. Transformers and rectifiers saw a downtick on the alleged certificate forgery. Uh, Hats and Agro jumped after re reporting an increase in numbers. PNC Infra on the back of a project win saw some smart moves. Krishna Dias Diagnostics uh, lost in trade on the back of a Rajasthan contract that was lost as well. So yes, a lot of movers and shakers in trade today. However, the broader markets for flat majority of the action was in the large cap names. And we are just around 30 points away from that 20,000 mark. Now, whether we will hit that in tomorrow's uh, opening session or not is anyone's guess. And that's what the markets will be watching out for. Back to you. Thanks, Cyril, for that. And while we talk about stocks in focus today, shares of Reliance Industries listed at 2,671 per share and exchanges conducted a special pre-open session to determine its share price after carving out Geo Financial Services as a separate entity. Geo Financial Services indicative price of 261.85 rupees per share was higher than the appointment of uh, uh, the appointment cost of 133 per share rupees that Reliance Industries had set. So every investor will get a share of Geo Financial for each one held in the parent. We spoke to um, uh, industry equity advisors, Sushil Choksi and Devin Choksi, to ask them what they think of the shares of Reliance Industries. Listen in. I personally feel 261 is a little stretched and I would rather look at uh, Geo financial business with a one year, two year outlook based on what they will achieve, how they achieve, how they integrate along with business plan on consumer lending, uh, retail financing, supply chain finance and other distribution capability. But it's fine. I think people are giving holding company 100% value plus the book value which is ascribed to the geo financial arm. And how are you trading on that basis? So this looks like almost four times book value at a starting block which seems expensive without having lending book organized or visible as on today. I'm not saying Reliance Geo will not do well. They will do well because they have management team. They must have enabled all the capabilities where financial services business required in processing, collection and rest of the matters. They may have million, two million customers overnight built up or more integrated with Reliance Retail as well as uh, telecom arm because reaching reaching out to customer and potential acquisition cannot be a problem for them. 
because their footfall in Reliance retail stores or customers where connectivity on electronic goods or the financing is concerned, they will be able to earn a triple A company. So borrowing cost and lending both should be on par with the best in the industry. So I don't see that, but discovery prices the first day is not that because there may be a retail frenzy to discover the price, how institution which own, own large chunk, how they behave and how they see the shape. So I would rather take a view whether it's geo financial or reliance as a parent, uh, one year, two year, three year outlook based on all the potential of three verticals what they run. Geo financial services is starting with a very, very strong uh, possibility of having the customer in its fold. Because in Reliance Retail, you already have the customers coming through the uh, physical stores, which are 18,000 plus. They also come to Reliance Retail's uh, e-commerce platforms like AGO as well as GeoMart. And that is where, again, I think the omni-channel presence is being created for the customer. At the same time, I think those customers are also included B2B customers. Those Irana stores, those Sakari Vandas, which are already part of Reliance Retail's grocery business they are also part of this particular platform. So I think a uh, very good proposition to start with for an NBFC company, that they have customers in place for them. Along with that, you have Geo platform in which you have got the mobile customer, enterprise customers, uh, the home customers. All these customers are there and Geo platform is basically offering all the uh, commercial services at the same time. So there is a bunch of customer available and that's not a small number. I think you can tap around 40 for 45 uh, roads customers, I think it's physically, I think we are talking about. So from a perspective of looking at the customer base, including in money control, which is a, uh, which is a site, I think, where you have got the maximum number of customers available, subscribers available onto the platform for uh, financial products and services. If all of them combine together and put across, I think, the respective business proposition of funding these customers, either Kirana stores on a B2B basis or retail customers on a B2C basis, I think what we are talking about is a sizable, large, addressable market. The other company is in focus today. Hindustan Unilever reported a single digit rise in profit in line with analyst estimates for quarter one. This despite its volume growing at the slowest pace since the first quarter of the previous fiscal. Sesa Sain joins us from the BQ Prime newsroom with all the numbers. Over to you, Sesa. Hindustan Unilever Limited has reported its first quarter earnings today. This is also Rohit Jawa, the newly appointed MD and CEO's first ever media interaction post his appointment in June this year. Now coming to the numbers, what we see that revenue was up 6%, net profit is up 7%, EBITDA is up 8% and margins came at 23.7%. Now what we know that the pricing growth has tapered off due to several price cuts initiated by the company in several categories such as soaps and laundry. However, the volume growth has also seen the slowest pace of uh, growth in the last five quarters. The company did highlight the return of the small players in the market, which has increased the competitive intensity. However, uh, HUL has gained market share in 75% of its categories. Now, what we also know that the, uh, the near-term outlook continues to be volatile due to weather disturbances. The company has also highlighted that the pricing growth will further tail off. Expect, uh, they also expect price growth to flat or uh, margin or be marginally negative. So let's hear from the management what they have to say in terms of the near term outlook, the demand uh, outlook, uh, the competitive landscape and as well as the company's strategy to uh, continue to be the market leader. With most commodities remaining stable in the quarter, inflation continues to moderate. Consequently, we are seeing a gradual recovery in market volume growth. FMCG market volumes grew in mid single digits led by urban Rural market volume, which at one point in time was declining in double digit, has just turned positive in this quarter. Having said that, we need to be cognizant that these growths have come on back of volume decline in the base. If we were to look at market growth on a two-year CAGR basis, total volume growth is still marginally negative. With softening of inflation, competitive intensity in the market is increasing. Media deployment, which saw a steep reduction during the high inflationary period has started normalizing and now it's almost back to 2019 levels. 
We are also witnessing resurgence of small and regional players, many of whom had vacated the market during the peak of inflation. An IT major emphasis is quarter one revenue came in line with estimates at 37,933 crore rupees. The net profit, however, failed to meet estimates, coming in at 5,945 crore rupees, as opposed to Bloomberg estimate of 6,245 crore rupees. While margins managed to uh, come in line at 20.8%, while Infosys also cut the financial year 2024 revenue growth guidance to 1% to 3.5%. As far as margins are concerned, Infosys sees margins at 20% to 22% for financial year 2024. There have been uh, delays in the start of some of these programs and the decision making in those. Coupled with that, we've also seen some of the volume during the quarter coming down because of peop uh, clients uh, in the industries that I mentioned, so financial services, uh, asset management, payments, mortgages, telco, uh, etc., in those specific industries, uh, reducing their volume of work. And those two things have combined for reducing the guidance. And BQ Prime hosted a panel on mental model for taking large bets. Addressing the India Opportunity Summit, Motilal Oswal's Ramdeo Agarwal said that he was focused on doubling investments in three years. NM Holdings' Manish Chokani advised investors that the correct approach to value investing is asymmetrical bets. Listen in. Investing is a very long process. All this, see, I mean, typically... When I started my career and so I was always investing for doubling in three years. Hmm. Okay. And typically take a bet of two and a half, three percent of my, uh, whatever is my corpus. And I'm very voracious buyer. So everybody has a different style. You would have different style. Everybody has a different style. Somebody buys 150% of the equity. I mean, whatever net worth. Somebody buys 100% like me and somebody buys 50% debt, 50% equity. So Everybody has a different style. I'm talking about whatever is your allocation of equity. In that, what should be the bet size? Okay. So the way I look at it is, I start with two and a half, three percent, because making it very small has no meaning. It will have no impact. Uh, but what happens is how long you hold. Like for public money, SEBI says you can't go. You can. You have a passive bridge beyond ten percent. Okay. So if uh, uh, today only I was doing some numbers, so. In 10 years, index is up about three, three times, hmm. roughly about three times. In 10 years, most of the good companies are up four times, four, five times. But look at Bajaj Finance. It's up some 20, 30 times or 40 times, whatever. So it's absolutely out of the charts. So if I had bet 2.5% on Bajaj Finance, I would not cut it. But what will happen is it will become 30, 40% of my portfolio. This is what really happened when the boom time comes. Don't feel like I want to buy 5%. Huh. I usually will not do it. And 25 is really the starting point. And okay. it kind of, you buy the 25 then you sleep overnight and see how it feels. Because something tells you from inside that I want to go to 5 or not. There are times, and he's right, where you feel, I can bet the house, I can go 10% on this. And both of us, I don't think we take leverage. No. There are people like others who will not buy 25 but they'll buy a levered two and a half. Sure. Yeah. But for every person who's become a billionaire, there are 99 million people who have gone to the streets. And honestly, in business, you make money either by margin or by velocity or by leverage. Velocity is really all our fellows who are buying and selling every day. I don't think it leads you a lot anywhere. Leverage to me is, I'm not in a hurry to get rich. It's a country with tailwinds behind us. If we follow the process, we basically will beat the market because you know what to avoid. So that itself is good enough. So if you focus on margin and asymmetrical bets is really the heart of it. That you, you ask for instance of an example. So my son had a small allocation and he brought out a company which was at that time a 1500 crore market cap. It had already delivered 150 crores of PAT and it had a 35% ROE. And on whatever we could see of capacity growth, 
you could see 400 crores is possible for this company in three years. Now, to me, that's a no-brainer and it's a bet that he took, which should be 10% of his portfolio. It's doing well and it's, a, it's not part of a mega trend or a theme, but it's something which fits into your macro understanding of where this business is going, where the world is going and it, it meets the promoter criteria, the business criteria, capital allocation criteria and so on and so forth. Sure. You would take that bet. 